All right, good afternoon, everybody. We'll go ahead and get uh, get started. And uh, I want to thank the community for either uh, joining us today or uh, listening on our Facebook uh, live uh, stream, on our YouTube live uh, stream, and on WNZF. So with technology now, there's no reason nobody can be engaged with the sheriff's office. But, you know, seven years ago, I started addressing crime together in meetings. And uh, the first one was at the Hilton Garden Inn, and we filled the place from the community. Uh, the good news uh, now is that crime is down so much that the rooms don't get quite as full, but then the technology also uh, helps us reach the community. But I think it's important that the community uh, knows uh, what is going on in their community when it comes to addressing crime together as part of guardianship policing. Uh, because we know that we can't do it alone and we need to do it with the community. And that's what guardianship policing is about, is about policing with the community, not policing the community. And when you change just that one word, it has a different, completely different meaning on how you serve a community. And I believe that an engaged community, informed community is a safer community. And uh, you'll see that uh, as we go through and then we'll talk about the trends that we saw in 2023 and what we're seeing so far in 2024. At the end, I'll uh, be glad to answer uh, any questions. For those listening online on the radio, obviously you're not gonna be able to see the PowerPoint that we're using, uh, but it will be up on our website in the next uh, day or so. So let me just kind of give you a little bit about the Sheriff's Office first, uh, since you may not know. Uh, we're the largest and only full-service law enforcement agency in the county. We provide uh, police services for the city of Palm Coast, town of Beverly Beach, town of Marineland, as well as the unincorporated areas. We also support the Flagler Beach and Bunnell Police Departments. Uh, we provide all court and detention services in Flagler County. And our jail's uh, technical name is the Sheriff Perry Hall Inmate Detention Facility uh, but as you know, I've nicknamed it the Green Roof Inn uh, when I was sworn in in 2017. We have a capacity in the jail of 404 by law. Uh, the division chief will say there's no way we can fit 404 in there, but that's what the law says we can do. Um, but to do that, they would have to be sleeping on what's known as sleds or plastic beds on the floor, basically, uh, to meet that capacity. Uh, we average anywhere from 275 to 300 inmates a night in the jail. And to tell you how that has changed, when I came in as sheriff in 2017, uh, the average daily population in the jail was 128. Uh, so you can see the change there. Uh, we also operate the 911 center in Flagler County that dispatches and handles all emergency and non-emergency calls for uh, the Sheriff's Office for all law enforcement, which would include Bunnell, Flagler Beach, and the Sheriff's Office, and also for the fire departments, for fire and rescue. And if we have a catastrophe in a county or a hurricane, uh, then we're handling uh, those calls that come in for emergency management also. Uh, there's more than 400 members of the Sheriff's Office serving you. Uh, that includes our volunteers. So there's 351 authorized full-time positions in the sheriff's office and then we have about 80 volunteers that do a lot of things for the community and you see them in the cars uh, driving around and say COP on the side. Just to uh, let you know what our mission is, uh, our mission is supporting a safe community through distinguished service and you'll see that we, uh, well let me jump to the next one, the vision to be nationally recognized for excellence and in innovative public service and community partnerships. And you'll see some awards that I'm gonna talk about that we uh, earned in 2023 and are receiving in 2024 that really uh, focuses in on that. And then our areas of focus in the Sheriff's Office is workforce excellence, technology maximization, positive community outcomes and operational excellence. And I will tell you that uh, when you read the mission, the vision, our areas of focus and coming up, you will see our core values. This was a bottom up. This was the employees that created this. 
it wasn't uh, top down. And uh, so our core values spell out trust. And that's proof right there that I didn't create this because I'm not that creative, uh, to be able to uh, come up with an acronym that I think is very appropriate. So the first uh, T is transparency. It's the fundamentals of unlocking partnerships with our community. Uh, and this is uh, an example of that, this meeting. Responsibility. It's our responsibility to uphold our profession. Uh, united. We want to stand and be united with the community and the service. Uh, our strength can only be measured by 100% effort uh, by every employee and, and volunteer in the sheriff's office. And teamwork is the foundation of our success. Uh, RNC is a four diamond accredited law enforcement agency. We are accredited by the Florida Law Enforcement Accreditation Commission. I served for six years on that commission. I was term limited after six years, and I served one year as chair. Uh, we're also accredited by the Florida Corrections Accreditation Commission, uh, Florida Telecommunications Accreditation, that's your 911 center, and the National Institute of Ethics. And hopefully uh, by the next uh, three or four months, uh, certainly uh, by the, by the uh, end of the year, but should be well before that, the jail medical will be accredited by the National Commission on Correctional Health Care. Now let me just try to put accreditation in perspective. There are agencies in Florida that do not even have one accreditation. It's not required. Um, there are agencies across the country that don't have even one accreditation. And your agency that serves you has four and about to have five accreditations. So I commend our team for being able to accomplish that. So let's look back in 2023, now that you know a little bit about the Sheriff's Office and the service. So as you know, our calls for service are going up as the population goes up. But our crimes uh, reported to us are down. Uh, they're down over 50% since 2017. Um, so, uh, and we're going to talk about that a little more. Our crashes actually last year went down a little, uh, but not a lot. Um, and because uh, people still can't drive in this county. Uh, in fact, that's one of our biggest quality of life complaints that, that we have is traffic. And as a result, uh, our traffic unit has increased 130%. Uh, since I've been sheriff, uh, when I came in, we had five motorcycles and that was it. We now have eight motorcycles and five Mustangs. And every patrol car now has radar uh, in it. So deputies need the tools to be able to uh, improve on quality of life complaints. And we had many cars that did not have uh, radar. And it's not just as simple as buying a radar and putting them in the car and say, okay, go out and enforce uh, the speeding uh, that's occurring in neighborhoods and our, our state roads. Every deputy then had to go through a 40-hour class to be certified as required by state law. So it was quite the undertaking to accomplish that. So our crime is down uh, over 50% since 2017. At the same time, our population has really grown. In fact, in the last three years, uh, there have been 16,000 new permanent residents in Flagler County. And uh, I will tell you that by, and I, I don't remember if I have a slide in this, but by 2035, so just 11 years from now, the population according to the University of Florida in Flagler County will be 172,000. And uh, so we're about 131,000 today. So you can see the growth that's coming. Uh, which is going to impact all the infrastructure and obviously uh, calls for service. And I can tell you that the study that uh, University of Florida has done uh, has not been wrong so far on their predictions. So despite the growth, um, the Palm Coast community did a national survey. 92% of residents felt safe in Palm Coast. And, and you know, I, as I drive around the community, I can see that because people are out walking, they're bicycling, they're using our trails. And in areas where a community doesn't feel safe, that doesn't happen. 
So that's kind of reconfirms uh, the survey in my mind. Um, the survey also said uh, sheriff policing services in the city, 84% of the respondents said those services are good or excellent. Obviously, we would like to see that number uh, go up. So some of my team is here today, so they're getting that message too that we want to continue to work on that. 82% uh, of the residents uh, rated crime prevention in the city either good or excellent. Of course, we want to improve that some more. And 81% felt very or somewhat safe about property crime. And you'll see that's our biggest issue in this county is property crime. And 84% felt safe from violent crime. Well, don't, don't just believe their survey. Here is what others say about Flagler County and the city of Palm Coast. Uh, we're the second uh, safest city in Florida out of 15 uh, in this. This slide only behind the villages. Uh, USA Today about three weeks ago named Palm Coast the second best Florida city to move to out of 30 in Florida. If you're curious about who's number one, it's Gainesville. Must be a lot of people like the Gators, is all I can figure, because they don't have a beach, they're landlocked, but uh, they came out number one, and Daytona Beach was seventh in that. And then you'll see uh, under the Palm Coast uh, sign that uh, across the country, uh, we are, uh, I don't know the exact number, uh, 39th safest city in the country. And these, these are not studies that we did. In fact, we didn't even know these were being done until uh, they were published. So here's how we do it and uh, in what we continue to focus on. So we use intelligence-led policing, which is uh, what we do is every week we have a crime mass meeting. In fact, it was just yesterday. So when I talk about trends that we're seeing uh, in 2024, it is hot off the press from yesterday when I get to that. Uh, and that crime maps is a meeting. We actually meet in this room. We go over what our real-time crime analysts have analyzed and identified as crime trends. And it's like a football playbook to our team. This is where you need to focus. This is who we think is doing the crime. And uh, usually if you make that list, you're in jail uh, within 24 to 48 hours. That's not the list you want to be on. It's probably worse than uh, the uh, Santa Claus is uh, bad list uh, because there's consequences with this one. We do adult and juvenile probation checks. So when adults and juveniles are on probation, we're knocking on their door and we're making sure they're in compliance with what the judge orders. We also make immediate contacts with the State Department of Corrections releases. So we're notified where they say they're going to live and we'll go knock on their door. And it does a couple things. One's it lets them know that we know they're out of state prison and, and we also know uh, what their crime was that they went to. But we also wanna give them a helping hand. If, they can, uh, if we can help them become productive citizens and not go back uh, into a jail or a prison, we're willing to do that. And then we also find out that some people don't tell the truth when they let the state know uh, where they're going to live because they don't live at that address. Uh, we've increased staffing and technology improvements, uh, LPRs uh, and rapid ID technology. So LPRs, I guarantee anybody that came here today uh, drove by at least one and probably multiple license plate recognition readers and you made it here because you're not a fugitive, you're not driven, driving a stolen car, um, you're not drawing an expired tag because all of that gets checked, drawing a suspended license and so forth. So we read about 1.5 million tags a week uh, in this county. And um, I attribute that in a motivated team to being able to reduce the crime the rate that we have. And some people ask, well, what about expectation of privacy? Well, the courts are very clear. On a public road, public property, there is no expectation of privacy. Uh, we use rapid ID. I know that you're going to find it's hard to believe that people will actually lie to a deputy sheriff, 
and the first clue is when you pull them over and you ask for ID and they don't they don't have their driver's license or you ask a passenger for their ID and they don't they can't produce anything most people carry ID and so we'll ask them their name their date of birth but I just had this happen uh, to me a few months ago when I pulled somebody over and uh, there were six people in the van and three ended up going to jail and uh, so the driver of course uh, did not have any ID. He told me his name and I uh, had him out on the side of the road uh, and I said, now let me explain something to you. I'm going to bring rapid ID here. Rapid ID looks about the size of a cell phone but it takes your fingerprint and it immediately sends it to the state and national databases. And if you have been arrested anywhere in this country, we will find out if it's your real name or not and we'll find out what you're arrested for. So we can do it right on the side of the road. And of course, uh, you know, I use some tactics like most cops do. Uh, what did you tell me your name was? Well, what was the date of birth? Because it usually tricks them because they never remember what they lied to you the first time. And uh, so that's exactly what happened here. And I said, well, that's not what you told me before. And we got rapid ID here. And while he's waiting for it, I can tell he's thinking about it. We put the rapid ID on, take his fingerprints, the deputy goes back to his car or waiting for the response to come back. He goes, well, maybe I should tell you uh, my real name. And he was a fugitive out of Putnam County. And so rapid ID technology, and we, we just ordered new rapid ID technology as an upgrade um, for, for our deputies in the field, uh, levels the playing field so that when people lie to us, we can try to verify uh, who they really are. We have a problem area crime enforcement team. That's like a tactical team. So during that crime maps meeting, when the playbook comes out, we focus our deputies and the PACE team has the ability to not have to be responding to the daily calls so they can focus uh, in these spot, hot spots. Real time crime center, uh, you can't see that today. It's in a secured area of the building, uh, but it is truly the nerve center besides the communication center uh, for this agency to reduce crime and solve crime. Uh, dedicated proactive traffic unit, which I already mentioned. And then, you know, while I like the law and order image of the sheriff, uh, if we can help an inmate turn their life around, so that they become productive citizens instead of costing the taxpayers money, uh, that would be uh, my preference. So we have a stride program in the jail, rehabilitating inmates, and we have a SWEAT program to redirect juveniles. SWEAT stands for Sheriff's Work Ethics and Training. So we would rather get to them before they've committed any serious offense. Sometimes the courts uh, send us uh, them and require them to go to our sweat program. Sometimes uh, parents that's having a problem with a child will sign a permission slip for the, the child to uh, participate in our sweat program. It's eight hours, uh, one day on a, on a weekend, and they have to, uh, they get to see uh, what it's like uh, to eat jail food. Uh, they, we get an inmate that comes in or a former inmate that says these are the wrong decisions I made and this is what happened to me and now I'm out of state prison and then they have to do community service for four hours uh, in the community. So I mentioned, mentioned the license plate recognition uh, readers. So this is just uh, we implemented it in 2019 and we continue to build on this system. So these are the statistics just from 2023. Six missing persons were located. So it's not just criminals that we locate. We locate missing and dangerous people. 29 fugitives were arrested. 30 stolen vehicles were recovered and 18 stolen tags. Now the reason I think this is so important and drives our crime reduction is because when we arrest 29 fugitives from an LPR hit, where we recover these stolen cars that were stolen in some other community and for some reason they came to Flagler. Why did they come here? We'll never know the answer to that, but if we can apprehend them before they can prey on our community, it drives the crime rate down. And that's why the technology is so important uh, that we use. So traffic fatalities, 
They were down a little bit from 2022. We had 25 traffic fatalities in 2023. That's still 25 too many. And so far this year, we're still having uh, more traffic fatalities than, than uh, we would prefer. I can tell you that uh, our uh, biggest uh, areas for traffic fatalities are on our state roads. So that's Interstate 95, it's State Road 100, it's US 11, uh, or County Road 11 rather, US 1. Uh, if it's a state road, that tends to be where our traffic fatalities occur. And uh, so we don't have very many uh, Florida Highway Patrol, Patrol troopers assigned to Flagler County. I have talked to the Colonel till I'm blue in the face about more troopers being here and they'll come in every so often and do a wolf pack, but we need more people assigned to Flagler County. There's more assigned to Putnam County, which has a lower population than we do, than we have assigned to Flagler County and we have an interstate uh, through uh, the county. The no <clears throat> excuse me, the number, the number one uh, crash area in Flagler County is Interstate 95. The number two is Old Old Kings and uh, Palm Coast Parkway. And, uh, so what do we do to try to reduce these wrecks? Because we had a slight reduction uh, last year. So we run operations with our partners. This is Operation Reckless. We do it at least once a month. A partnership with the Ohio Patrol, uh, the Benel and uh, Flagler Beach Police Department in its strict enforcement. The other thing that we do is we want to teach our teenagers how to drive safely. You know, when I went to school and probably most people in this room, you got you got driver's ed in, in high school and that's pretty much gone now. So our traffic unit uh, does teen driver challenge. It's a partnership uh, with uh, State Farm Insurance and the Florida Sheriff's Association. And they actually get taught by our, our traffic unit uh, staff and then they uh, actually have a driving course that we set up uh, in a parking lot, uh, typically at uh, Flagler Palm Coast uh, High School. Uh, you can see uh, the upcoming dates uh, on the screen. If not, for those that are listening, you'll find it on our website. We run uh, Undercover operations to arrest the poison peddlers in our community. This was Operation Heartbreaker, uh, in which uh, we seized uh, four firearms, sixty-four hundred dollars in cash, uh, five hundred and forty-one grams of cocaine, one hundred and forty-two grams of fentanyl, two hundred twenty-six grams of methamphetamine, three hundred sixty-four grams of cannabis, and twenty-seven grams of MDMA for a total street value of $745,000. So undercover operations, we get, we work these generally based on complaints uh, from the community. Uh, and that's why it's so important to be engaged with our community uh, because you know where you live if you have a suspicious house in your neighborhood. A lot of traffic in and out, people stopping five minutes or less. You know what's going on. We want those tips. So send us that information. It may take six, eight months to make the case uh, so we can get a warrant for an arrest or a search warrant to get into that house. But we take all those tips seriously. It was a tip a little over a year ago now where we took down a drug trafficking organization that was based in Flagler County. And it took us, it was about an 18 month undercover operation along with uh, not only was the sheriff's office involved, but federal agencies and other local agencies. And that took us all the way to our car a cartel in Mexico. Now, the FBI won't, won't uh, and DEA won't let us say the name of the cartel uh, because that part of the investigation is still continuing. Uh, but we arrested people in that investigation in Los Angeles Phoenix, Arizona, and in Volusia and Flagler County. And the leader of it was based here. They have all been convicted in, in federal court uh, and they are all now in a federal uh, prison. And so uh, we take it seriously to try to curtail uh, the poison peddlers. We also know there's quality of life issues. So 
sometimes the courts don't do well in solving a neighborhood problem, so we look for uh, other ways and other means to do it. So we used the nuisance abatement injunction. This was a house on uh, western Flagler County in the Mondex. Um, and I personally have been to this house, I can't tell you how many times on my Friday night patrols. And uh, so when the courts weren't really dealing with the offenders in this house, this was a homesteaded property. So even though we were buying drugs, we couldn't, we couldn't seize the property under forfeiture because it was homesteaded. So we did the next best thing. It took about a year to do this uh, in the court system, but we served uh, and got it through the courts as a nuisance uh, home. And even though the person that owned this house at the time uh, homesteaded it, he cannot live there. He's been permanently evicted uh, from his own house, which also means that he loses his homestead exemption, which means the next time we buy drugs from there, we can go after that property. It also means that if the five individuals uh, that we had cases on, <clears throat> over 130 calls for service at this one house. Okay? It was destroying the quality of life in that, that neighborhood and on that street. And so we used the civil nuisance abatement laws uh, to enjoin them, basically. And so uh, uh, three of these individuals, uh, they had seven days to vacate. Two of them were already uh, uh, in the jail, so they were already vacated. And uh, the other uh, three decided to test the judge. And the judge gave him seven days to vacate. We gave him an extra day. And then the other three got arrested because they didn't believe the judge was, I guess, or we were gonna enforce the injunction. And so the one that tried to hide from us, Cody Driggers, uh, he got 90 days. Well, guess what? Less than two weeks ago, we caught him again on the property. And uh, Judge Franz uh, was not very uh, happy with him that he violated his order. So now he's gonna be a resident of the Green Roof Inn for the next six months. Uh, for violating the judge's order. So hopefully he'll learn his lesson this time. And if you're wondering who owns a house now, it was sold to another family member, which they legally could do. Um, but the family member knows that if any of these people come back on the property or any more criminal activity occurs, uh, that we will go after uh, the property. Sometimes, you know, in the news, there's been a lot about squatters. In fact, the governor in the legislature just uh, passed a bill and the governor just signed it, giving law enforcement some more tools for squatters to just take over a house. And we have a lot of people live here six months and then go to another home in another state for six months. And so in some jurisdictions, some states, uh, you come home and you find somebody living in your house, you have to go through an entire eviction process. In a couple cases, the actual owner of the house has been arrested in those jurisdictions. Well, that's not gonna happen in Florida, but before the governor signed the law and the legislature passed a new law, we, this was a house on a cul-de-sac in the B section of Flagler County, and a beautiful home uh, neighborhood, except for this one house. And uh, it just looked terrible. In fact, there was a gentleman trying to sell his house that I talked to after we raided it. And uh, he said, you know, I can't even sell my house here. And he had a beautiful house. And so what we used was the trespassing laws. And we got the absentee owner who lived in Volusia County to come and trespass all these people. Uh, and they had to leave the house immediately. So we stayed there until they did. And then we uh, staked it out because we figured they would come back. But they must have figured out our tactics because they did not come back. Uh, and uh, we put up the sign. So hopefully that cleaned up uh, at least that street. And what we try to do, every case is different. So you have to look at the facts of the case. The one on Blueberry where we evicted the owner uh, and the people that were causing all the problem permanently out of the house. Uh, it was the facts of the case that allowed us to do that. It was the facts of this case that allowed us to use the trespassing laws. I mentioned uh, the jail population, uh, 128 inmates a night 
Uh, we had a high in 2023 of 273 inmates a night on average. Uh, we did hit 300 a couple times. So far this year, we're seeing a little, re little bit of a reduction. We're running about 270, 275 inmates a night in the jail. Um, I mentioned that we want to try to turn people's lives around. So the STRIDE program uh, we have there, inmate work crew, saves taxpayers over $100,000. They cannot come to your house to mow your yard, okay, just like they can't come to mine. Uh, but uh, government-owned properties, like they do all the landscaping maintenance in the building at the Sheriff's Operations Center. They were just here the last couple of days uh, doing things, uh, which saves money. In the jail, we had a fatherhood program, Inside Out Dad, because we know from studies that a missing father tends to have a dramatic impact for generations on their kids. And so we want to give the parents, the dads that are in our jail, the understanding what their absentee uh, parenting causes. And many of them came from absentee uh, parents. So we have that program to give them the skills so they know how it impacts uh, with um, uh, their kids when they're in jail. I guess we're having some technical issues. I'm just getting the tablet. Okay. I guess they're not being able to hear me online. And give them the skills to be an engaged parent when they leave. And so we have that program. Uh, we also know that most inmates in a county jail are going to go back into the community. Some are going to go to a state correctional facility based on the crime that they're using or committed. Uh, but some are going to, but most will be released. We average about 300 people arrested a month uh, in this county, and most of them are going back uh, into the community. So we have a homeward bound program. We have a partnership with Flagler Technical College. Uh, that gives them some skills. So in the jail, we have HVAC and electrical apprenticeship programs. Um, we have programs to assist uh, inmates with job placement before they're released with jail. And a lot of these partnerships aren't costing the taxpayer anything because they are partnerships with various churches. Uh, as I mentioned, Flagler Technical College, and uh, workforce. And uh, the photo that you're seeing with the jail van, um, we added, so there's a funny story to this. So we have to run around the state and pick up uh, people that are wanted in Flagler County to get picked up somewhere else. So we, uh, you know, we don't have to pay tolls because we're a government vehicle. So we added on the back of it, kind of a tongue in cheek thing, uh, green roof in courtesy van courtesy shuttle all of a sudden we started getting invoices for the tolls I guess they didn't see the sheriff on the lower left corner now we still don't have to pay it it's just a little work that we got to point out the picture look at the lower left it's a sheriff vehicle it's not truly a hotel uh, so that's one of those uh, unintended consequences I mentioned Homeward Bound, so some of the other programs that we do in partnership with Flagler Schools and Flagler Technical College, uh, it teaches practical job skills through training courses. So I, you know, we're a high growth community, a lot of building going on. I talked to some of the builders in some of the uh, subs, what do you need the most? So they gave, gave me a list and I, I took it to our de uh, detention chief. Uh, so some of the things that we do uh, we have a program for vinyl graphics application. So every patrol car that you see uh, has had the decals applied, printed, cut, applied by an inmate, okay. giving them their skills for that. We have the air conditioning, we have electrical, we even have a sewing program uh, in the jail. Uh, so now instead of us contracting out for alterations that are needed on uniforms, the inmates do it. And, and to be candid with you, their job uh, sewing is better than what we were getting contracting it out uh, locally. And we worked, we partnered with uh, a community member 
because uh, we don't know anything about sewing. We're cops, right, or, we're, or uh, detention. And in fact, our division chief in the jail, when I said I wanted a sewing program, he thought I was nuts. And uh, I asked him the status of it, and he finally understood that I was serious and implemented a great one. He reached out to the community, and they told us what kind of machines to buy, commercial machines, those kind of things. So where, where we would have paid $60,000 to sew on new patches, uh, inmates did it for virtually free. The equipment that's used that we needed to do vinyl graphics that do the sewing was purchased at no cost to the taxpayer using inmate welfare funds because it's for improvement in skill teaching of the inmates. So uh, we won a lot of awards. SMART program has been highlighted on Channel 6 News multiple uh, times uh, about the programs that we're doing in the jail. Uh, your jail won the American Jail Association 2023 uh, innovation award for a jail our size, so a medium-sized uh, jail. And uh, we won it, the jails won a couple other awards uh, also. Uh, I believe in bringing back as much money as we can that our taxpayers are paying. This money is going to go somewhere, and we might as well bring it back to Flagler County because it's going to go to South Florida. If it's an, a federal uh, grant, then it's going to go who knows where. It could go to West Virginia, California, it's going to go somewhere. So let's bring it back here. So I have a great team. We look for grants all the time. And uh, in 2024, uh, so far, uh, we've been awarded $3.7 million in grants. And it's a variety of grants. Uh, jail mental health. Uh, we now have mental health in the jail, addiction treatment in the jail. All of that's paid for uh, by a grant. And you can see it here. The list goes on and on. Uh, t tonight, actually, we're going to be unveiling what you're seeing right now, this new Tidewater uh, uh, patrol boat. This was a partnership between Florida Inland Navigation District uh, and a fine grant, so they paid half the cost of this boat, and the Sheriff's Office paid the other half, or I should say the taxpayers paid the other half, the local taxpayers. The fine money actually comes from uh, your boating uh, registration every year. In this boat, so we have a big boat that we can actually take uh, out into the ocean if we needed to for water rescue. And, and the boat that we had prior to uh, the Boston Whaler, uh, you could only take out into the Atlantic Ocean if it was a very calm day. Well, trust me, you never need a rescue in a calm day. It's always because of inclement weather or something that goes on. So we have now a boat to do that, but the boat is too big to do a lot of the canals that we have in Flagler County and Palm Coast, and especially to go under some of the low bridges over the canals. So we worked with Find to buy this boat. It has a lower draft, and the Bimini top can go down so it can fit underneath uh, most of the low-hanging uh, bridges. So that's going to be unveiled today. If anybody's interested, at 6 p.m. at the Palm Coast Community Center, Find is having a, a community meeting. And uh, this should be operational. The goal is to have it in service uh, by uh, Memorial Day weekend. So let's talk about some future challenges, what we're seeing in, in 2024. So a study, and you may have read about this, uh, that uh, we're 37 law enforcement deputy sheriffs short uh, for the community of our size. Uh, it used to be a lot worse than that. Uh, when we first did the study, we were over 80 deputies short. And this is not a study done by me. It was consultants that we received the grant on uh, to uh, do that study. And I worked with the city of Palm Coast officials and the Board of County Commissioners to cut that down. Uh, but we're still 37 deputies short. So uh, there was just uh, less than a month ago, there was a joint meeting between the Board of County Commissioners, City of Palm Coast officials to talk about public safety, how to fund it, and how to fairly distribute the cost of these deficit deputies. Just keep in mind, these deputy uh, deficit deputies don't include the growth. 
that we're seeing. It doesn't include the impact that when you have more deputy law enforcement deputies, the impact in the jail, the impact in the 911 center, the impact in records, CSI, and the list goes on. This was focused here. So that's something that we have to work on. So here's what we saw in 2023. We saw residential burglaries go up a little bit, but let me tell you where they are. So I don't want you to think that the home that you're living in, you need to be fearful in your home. These are homes under construction, but because of the way the law is, is written on how we have to report it, it could be a home under construction with no doors, no windows, and somebody goes in there and steals lumber or drywall uh, or they go in and vandalize the house. That has to be reported now as a burglary. And so, so we saw those and they are centered around uh, construction sites. Domestic violence, we saw an increase in domestic violence. Domestic violence was trending down prior to COVID. When COVID came and everybody uh, movement was restricted and sometimes their jobs were eliminated or hours were cut back, it added more stressors into a relationship that maybe wasn't that good to begin with. And so that's a recipe for domestic violence. And so we saw that go up. Now I have another uh, opinion or theory, can't prove it, on some of this with domestic violence. We've had a lot of new residents from all over the United States move into our county, 16,000 in the last three years. And maybe they don't take domestic violence seriously where they came from. So they found out here that we do. And, uh, and we'll talk about that. So I think not only is it an education component, but I think that's a piece of it. Our larcenies are up. The larcenies that are up are shoplifters. That could be a part of uh, the economy uh, also. Uh, it's usually at the big box uh, stores, Target, Walmart, those kind of locations. And then the robberies were up in 2023, but the robbery, it was statutorily, it was a robbery uh, under the statute, but it was generally a known suspect. It was somebody they knew and they stole from them in a, in a violent manner uh, or it was a drug deal uh, that was actually a ripoff. So here's what we're seeing in 2024. Construction site thefts still occurring, uh, still up uh, uh, some, uh, and some of it includes vandalism. Uh, and some of it's vandalized by adults because they didn't really want that house built next to them on that vacant lot. Uh, some of them are obviously are uh, juveniles. Scams and frauds are up uh, 4% uh, year to date. Uh, we've had uh, about 100 cases in 2024 uh, compared to 2023. Uh, I just mentioned all of that. But before I move on, hot off the press, let me tell you what we're seeing as of yesterday. So we'll talk about violent and domestic crimes. Um, assault and battery is actually down so far, 35%. Domestic disturbance is down 4%. Physical disturbance is down 44%. Disturbance with weapons that are uh, family related down 25%. Sex offenses down 5%. Stalking though is up 133% and violation of injunctions are up 55%, and our robberies are down 50%. So my message to this is, if you have an order by a judge to stay away from the victim, you need to do that. Because if not, you're gonna get arrested. And when you're arrested again, it's no bond until you see the judge again. And the judges don't, frankly, like their injunctions being violated. As far as the stalking, if you're breaking up with someone, a husband, a boyfriend, girlfriend, uh, whatever your spouse relationship is, don't stalk them uh, because you're going to get arrested. And uh, so you can prevent a lot of this 
by just complying. And there's a reason that you broke up. You know, let the individual go if that's if that's what uh, they want to do. It might not be what you want to do, but then if you continue to harass them and stalk them, you're going to get yourself arrested in there. We just had a case uh, uh, yesterday, or maybe it was the day before, as the inter news just interviewed me on this case, so you'll see it on the news tonight, where they got in an argument. They were living in a, um, a pull-behind trailer uh, on, on uh, some land out on the west side, and they got into a, a domestic argument, 1.30 in the morning. It continued into the next morning, and uh, the male side of this uh, wanted to take the trailer and uh, empty its tanks at a county park that was about 2.2 miles away. So they wanted the, the wife and the two children out of the trailer to do it. Well, they refused to get out of the trailer. So he backs his pickup truck into it, in, into the trailer, hooks it on, and takes them for a wild ride down to the county park. Now, it's a violation of traffic laws, number one. You can't have people in a trailer that you're pulling around. But then he, he empties it. They tried to, they were gonna get out, but then they were afraid that uh, he was gonna take off and leave them there, and he had taken the cell phone. And so they stayed inside the trailer and had a wild ride back where he was slamming on the brakes and just driving crazy uh, back. Things were falling on the kids on the inside. And so obviously he got arrested for domestic violence and, and child neglect. Um, that whole thing could have been avoided. Take a deep breath, walk away, de-escalate yourselves. But instead it's about winning. And so you don't, they didn't control the anger. He backs up, takes off, and uh, could have killed him. In fact, uh, if you listen to 911 call, uh, the mother that called in, the wife, uh, thought that's what he was trying to do with the way he was driving and it could have been avoided so continued to escalate it and found himself arrested so on our crime maps we have focused crimes here's where we are today uh, commercial burglary uh, we're up by one um, residential burglary uh, it's actually down trending right now so uh, you know, construction has slowed a little bit. Maybe that's going to help us there. We'll see. Uh, car breaks are up by seven uh, compared to the same time last year. Uh, we're seeing a different trend on the car breaks uh, that we've seen. Uh, now it's smash and grab. So they're smashing windows that the cars are locked. But that can also be prevented if you don't leave things of value visible in the car. Our shoplifters, they're up 32 uh, or 80% so far this year. And uh, stolen vehicle recoveries are down by 8%. Um, hopefully the criminals are getting the message to not come to Flagler County uh, because we will arrest you. So let me, let me talk to you a little more in depth since we want to talk about trends so that you know what's going on. 33% uh, of the car breaks that have been reported this year had forced entry, and that's that's a change because normally it's pull the door, and if the door's locked, they go to your neighbor's car or they go to the next car in the driveway. And if they're all locked, they would just continue on. Now they're breaking the windows, um, and that's a significant uh, amount uh, increase. Uh, last year, uh, for the same time, only 17% of car breaks uh, were through broken windows or tampering with the locks. And so uh, remember to not leave things of valuable where people that are sneaking around at 3 o'clock in the morning or in a shopping center parking lot can see it. Uh, larcenies uh, tend to be, besides shoplifting, and I'll talk more about that, uh, bicycle thefts. Uh, but the e-bikes now are becoming more prevalent uh, targets. So if you have a bicycle and, or an e-bike and you go shopping somewhere, put a chain around it, lock it up, do some crime prevention instead of just getting off your bike and going into the store because it might not be there 
uh, when you come back. Uh, the businesses that we're seeing the bikes get stolen from are Publix and Walmart uh, and outside residences or um, daylight or residential uh, burglaries, uh, thefts. Okay, so might be daylight out, but lock your bike up, put it in the garage, put a chain around it, do some uh, crime prevention on your part. Uh, shoplifting, I mentioned, is up uh, about 80% compared to the same time last year. But here is uh, what we're finding. 73% uh, of the shoplifting cases are the result of self-checkout, either skip scanning, in other words, you scan one item, skip the next item, or the next two items and scan another one, or barcode uh, swapping. Uh, that's what we're seeing trends for the shoplifting. And that may be why so many uh, big box stores now are talking about ending the uh, self-checkout. Uh, you're seeing that around the country. Uh, just so you know, uh, uh, loss prevention at Walmart uh, let us know about a scam that's going on around the country in larger department stores. They're involving baby items. So they're taking a shopping cart around, filling it full of baby items, and then asking people that they need money to pay for all these baby items and we're a generous, nice community. They give them the money and then the people abandon the shopping cart and walk out the store uh, with, uh, without buying anything. So it was a scam to get you uh, to give them money. So just be aware of that. That's occurring. All right. It looks like I'm stuck. More technology issues here. Okay, it's not moving. It's frozen. I guess I talk too much about larcenies or scams. Okay, thank you. Uh, so just to kind of finish up how you can uh, help prevent uh, crime, uh, lock it up, vehicles, houses, garages, businesses, sheds, bicycles, everything. Uh, take your keys and key fobs with you. Remove valuables from plain view. Uh, lock up the bicycle and record the serial number. We recover a lot of bicycles that we find abandoned, but we need some way to prove it's yours to give it back to you. If not, the bike men of Florida or Flagler County are going to get it. He's sitting right here in the front. Uh, keep the garage doors closed, uh, even when you're at home. And, you know, one thing about crime being down so much is that there's a, fent, uh, a feel of safety, which is a good thing. To do. You saw that on the Palm Coast uh, survey, but that doesn't mean you don't do your own crime prevention. Uh, reminder for parents, um, know what your child is doing and who they are with at all times, whether it's in person or on the internet. Be the sheriff of your home. In coming up, uh, we're doing a partnership uh, program just uh, for kids and parents, a partnership with the FBI and Flagler Schools about how you can help protect uh, your kids uh, in their activity on smartphones. So that's coming up on August 21st. It'll be at the Flagler Auditorium and uh, look at our website for more information on that. Some of the new initiatives for 2024, we're going to continue to leverage uh, technology to combat crime. We're going to add a, a number of new license plate recognition readers. And by the way, every patrol car that we have has a, a uh, car camera. So we have body cameras and we have car cameras. Every one of those car cameras is, is a license plate recognition reader also. So every car driving around is reading license plates. Uh, we're going to continue to work with the county and the city to bring our staffing levels up to the appropriate level. Hey, look, when the, when the county and I, uh, in the two cities, or the city of Palm Coast, the county commission, and I all met and discussed the study that was done and analyzed by the city of Palm Coast, 
the headlines were, the sheriff wants 37 more deputies. We can't afford 37 more deputies in one swoop. I probably couldn't even fill 37 new deputies at one swoop. So that's a phase in, and the media never really reported it that way. So the study actually uh, was recommendation that went to the Board of County Commissioners and the City of Palm Coast was 12 next fiscal year, 12 the following fiscal year, and 13 the year after that. Uh, and so we, we understand that. Um, we're going to continue to work with our builders to prevent construction uh, site thefts. Uh, Rapid SOS is a way that we can, you can contact uh, the communication center uh, and prepare it live where we can send you a link and if you accept it and want to share what your phone is seeing then our dispatchers can see what's going on in real time to provide the information to responding deputies and in the next month or so uh, we will be one of only 11 agencies uh, or 11 counties I should say sheriff's offices that have rapid DNA in booking and uh, we received a grant from the state of Florida uh, to do that. And uh, we're a test uh, location for a medium-sized jail. And so here's what that means. Under the statute in Florida law, it says what the criteria is to do rapid DNA, which means somebody gets arrested, they meet that criteria, we do a swab, we put it in the rapid DNA uh, machine, and, and within, uh, uh, probably just hours we'll find out if they're if they're a match for an unsolved crime or wanted for a crime anywhere in the country and so we'll be doing that uh, last year uh, we took delivery of a new mobile command center uh, this is a state-of-the-art uh, facility uh, it was two years in the making uh, mainly because of supply chain issues uh, but this vehicle will last 30 plus years for this agency because it was custom built for the job that it's needed. So it's kind of like a fire truck. If you build it for the job, it's going to last forever. Technology might have to be uh, updated uh, over that time frame. Uh, and hopefully we don't have to use it for any major crimes. Uh, so you'll only hopefully mostly see it for community events, but we're prepared. Um, we found that during the hurricanes, our first responders, you know, restaurants were closed. Uh, we couldn't really feed them properly. And so the drug dealers of Flagler County uh, paid for a commercial grade uh, cooking trailer as part of our emergency restaurant team, but we called it the emergency, I'm sorry, the emergency response team, but we called it the emergency response team, the restaurant team, I'll get it right. Uh, it's a commercial grade, uh, cooking and so now we're self-contained in fact when we first got this we were deployed through the Florida Sheriff Association task force to assist uh, Swanee and Taylor County uh, for the hurricane that came through up there and so we were totally self-contained there uh, awards and recognitions uh, mentioned the American Jail Association Innovation Award our volunteers uh, received the International Associated Chiefs of Police uh, Award for uh, our volunteer program. Uh, Detective Adam Gossett uh, was the Crime Stoppers, uh, Northeast Florida Law Enforcement Officer of the Year for Flagler County. Our Communications Supervisor, uh, Heather uh, Robinson, received the APCO uh, Supervisor of the Year Award. And then our Flagler County Communication Specialist First Class. Uh, uh, I don't see her name here. Yeah, thank you, Megan Burton. Uh, received the Florida Sheriff Association 2024 Dispatcher of the Year. And that is the second time in three years that the people that are serving you that you never see but you talk to them on the phone won that coveted award very competitive against the 67 sheriffs. And you have to really be trained and really deliver a quality service to get that award. So I'm very proud of our team. Uh, 2023 Law Enforcement Deputy of the Year was Deputy First Class Jennifer Pravat. 
2023 Support Employee of the Year is Communications Specialist First Class Megan Burden. Our 2023 Detention Deputy of the Year is Corporal Peter Descartes. And our 2023 Volunteer of the Year was our Volunteer COP Chief uh, Robertson Brown. So we thank and commend all of them. But that's just a representative of the men and women that serve you daily. Some upcoming events that we hope you join us. We'll have a realtor safety event August 24th at 10.30 a.m. at Flagler County Association of Realtors. We've been doing this for a long time, but now the interest dramatically increased after uh, we had that one uh, realtor assaulted uh, by, frankly, a, a pervert. And uh, due to the good uh, team effort and our real-time crime center and technology, we were quickly able to identify him and get him in custody. So uh, now this, that'll probably be a full class there, Mike, wherever wherever uh, Commander Lutz is. There he's back there in the back. A Touch a Truck event, May 11th at 9 a.m. at Palm Coast Town Center. And uh, that's where uh, you can bring your kids, grandkids. They can see a lot of our big uh, vehicles and they can touch it, get inside, sit on some of them. Uh, but it's not just the sheriff's office, fire trucks, it's construction vehicles, utilities, you name it. It's a pretty good event. So hopefully you can see there. You can stay updated on what we're doing and our what's going on in the community uh, by following us on our social media platforms or download the, the sheriff's office app. Just search uh, Flagler Sheriff on the app platforms. Some other events coming up. We're going to have our annual memorial here. Uh, it's on May 8th at 7.45 p.m. It'll be outside uh, the Operations Center to remember our six uh, fallen heroes. Uh, so please come and join, and let's remember those that gave their life uh, serving this community and their families that also sacrificed uh, so much. Uh, we're also doing something uh, new. So we have two areas that are uh, grass uh, alongside the monuments uh, back behind you where you're sitting uh, and we're going to change out that grass and put bricks in there so we're selling uh, selling bricks and uh, if you would like to uh, purchase a brick you can go to our website or uh, copy this QR, QR code and uh, uh, you can see renderings of what it will look like on the back table uh, and also what a brick will look like. There's two different sizes. So uh, we'll let you pretty much put whatever you want in there, but there is a vetting process, so it does have to be appropriate. Remember, it's to uh, remember our fallen heroes. And then you can follow us, uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Uh, download our app uh, just on this QR code. And then you can always volunteer with us. Uh, we have the Florida or Flagler Sheriff's Employee Assistance Trust. Uh, some have asked me, where is the Sheriff's Gala this year? What date? We have postponed it. It's going to be in 2025 in February. Uh, it was too close from the last one. And uh, we just didn't think uh, uh, it, was the, it was just too close together to ask people to donate again. And then you can volunteer with our COPs. We also have autism awareness. If you have an autistic uh, child or adult, uh, you can register with the sheriff's office. You get stickers for your car, stickers for your home, so that if the deputy stops the car or gets a call to your house, deputies have all been trained on how to deal with autistic individuals. And this will let them know uh, that uh, there's an autistic individual uh, in the car or the home. We also have trackers because we know that they tend to be wanderers uh, that that you can uh, uh, apply for. And then we also have scent kits that we can give you in case they do wander off so that our bloodhound has a good starting uh, point. Um, come to the Sheriff's Citizens Academy. We got one going. Uh, in right now, the next uh, session will be the fall session. Starts September 10th, runs through October 17th. It's two evenings a week during that time. You really get to see a behind the scenes look at the sheriff's office. 
uh, and you can ride with a deputy sheriff if you would like to. It's, that part is optional. Join a neighborhood watch group uh, and uh, join a women's self-defense class. And we get rave reviews on the women's self-defense class. We've uh, graduated over 3,000 women. Um, and let me just say class three is the only class that you can legally beat up a deputy sheriff while you're testing your new skills, okay? And uh, I can tell you that some of, some of the ladies in Flagler County take full advantage of that opportunity in there. And then uh, we're always looking for people to join our team. Uh, you can uh, uh, go to joinflaglersheriff.com and look what we have available. I can tell you that we're hiring for law enforcement deputy sheriffs. We're hiring for detention deputy sheriffs. We're hiring in our communications center um, in a variety of other positions. So we're a fast growing agency, which means career opportunity. We're very competitive in our starting pay and our benefits in the region. Uh, this community is a great community to serve law enforcement in uh, because it really supports uh, our agency. Uh, and basically anything you want to do, uh, if you're looking for a job, you can do here because we have everything. And we even have an aviation function now. Now it might not be a helicopter or a plane, but it's a drone. And uh, you have to be licensed uh, by the feds to be able to fly it and so forth. So you can do anything. Uh, that you want. So with that, I'll be glad to uh, answer any questions. Are we monitoring any questions on Facebook Live? So if you're on, if you're on Facebook Live and you have a question, you can type it in. The staff will get it to me. Yes, ma'am. I'm not aware of uh, either the county or the city of Palm Coast uh, planning any curfews. So the only curfews that we deal with currently is during an emergency, such as a hurricane or something like that, when an emergency order is put out. Uh, what I can tell you is that if they are on the golf course and things like that, you should call us. Just know that if you're not the owner of the golf course or a representative, we can still go there and check them uh, and make sure they're not doing anything, but we need the owner to enforce a trespassing. Okay. So, other questions? Ed? Sheriff, I'd like to thank you and your staff that are running the law enforcement all over. Uh, it's an outstanding job done at the University of Louisville graduate. Uh, that said, he's a UK graduate. He always digs me, <laughs> just so everybody knows. So an RPO, uh, so the question is, have there uh, been on domestic violence more uh, RPOs? RPOs is a, a way that law enforcement uh, can go before a judge to request um, a protective order. Uh, we're running about the same, I think, that we always have. Each one of those get vetted. Um, I am a, uh, a staunch Second Amendment person. Um, a life member of the NRA, so we vet those before pretty strong. We want to make sure it's a case with um, uh, serious concerns uh, that the offender uh, may do something to the victim and before we go and just take guns. And uh, so there's, in some, in some, uh, uh, some people know those as red flag laws and uh, uh, but if, if, if somebody shows a propensity that they're going to do something, I'm not going to let that happen on my watch. Okay. And the state of Florida legislature just passed a law. It doesn't go in effect until January 1st, requiring law enforcement to do a threat assessment. We already do threat assessments in this agency, but now it's going to be by statute. Uh, so across the state, every domestic violence call the threat assessment has to be done. Okay. Yes. Sure. Uh, has there been any notice of an increase in the homeless population and the baking that goes on at the intersection? 
So the question has been, for those in case somebody couldn't hear it, an increase in the homeless population and the, uh, the panhandling that goes along with it. So let me tell you what we generally see. What we generally see is when it's cold up north, our homeless population increases, and when it starts to warm up here, they go back up north, and then it will reduce. Uh, a year or so ago, we worked with uh, the Florida, uh, uh, the local District 5 Secretary for the Florida Department of Transportation, and we put signs up uh, with their permission uh, for trespassing on the exit ramps to Interstate 95 on a property they own. Uh, that worked until, uh, and of course, what it really did was displace them, okay, from to a, to a, off their property. And uh, so those signs were up until a complaint went to Tallahassee, and the Secretary of Florida Department of Transportation uh, decided that the local secretary did not have the authority uh, to do that. So they took all the signs down. Now they've recently put up signs again uh, with the verbiage that the state wanted. Um, so we can enforce at those locations. The U.S. Supreme Court has ruled, though, that it is not poor, or it's not illegal to be poor or homeless. So the ordinances that were used and the state laws that were used for decades were thrown out probably 25, 30 years ago. And so there's a few communities that have tried to implement ordinances since then, and they generally get tied up in litigation. So the problem that we in law enforcement have, so this county, Flagler County, does not have a designated homeless shelter. Now it could be a park, it doesn't have to be a structure, but there's not a designated location. If we move someone off of public property that does not, and we do not have another location that they can go to, we can be sued in federal court and we will lose it. So our hands are handcuffed on that issue. This really is a societal issue. It's not a law enforcement issue. I don't think anybody likes the appearance, and I've, I've seen you know, the mother with two little kids panhandling on the side of the road and they're drawing on your, your heart to give them money. Whether or not they're legit, I don't know. We can check them out and make sure they're not a fugitive, they're not wanted somewhere, um, and that the, the children are properly being cared for. So it's a very uh, uh, hard issue to solve, uh, but it's really not law enforcement until they commit a crime. And so there's just not, and, you know, Daytona, Volusia County built a homeless shelter. Well, here's what my experience has been because when I was in Orange County as the undersheriff there, they opened a homeless shelter in downtown Orlando. The homeless tend to have, not all, but a lot of the homeless don't want to go to a shelter because they don't want to abide by the rules. And the rules are no alcohol, no drugs, and so on and so forth. And so while a homeless shelter can help for the right people that really want to turn their life around or need a helping hand because no fault of their own, they lost their job or whatever and now they're homeless, that won't pick up uh, the people that you generally see. Yeah. So there's not a fast solution. So the question is about cyber crime. Uh, yes, we do have a cyber crimes unit. It's mostly focused on uh, crimes against uh, children uh, that's done on the internet, pornography, those kind of things. Um, but what I will tell you, uh, cyber crime is a problem across this country. Uh, it's uh, difficult to investigate uh, because most of the offenders are not in this country. Uh, they're going to be in a foreign country. And I can tell you that the federal government, who would have jurisdiction mostly, uh, the FBI, uh, maybe Secret Service on their financial side, uh, generally unless it gets into the large 
$5 million. Not $1 million isn't big enough. $5 million generally isn't big enough. A big deal uh, is the only time they can investigate it because there's so much of it. So it really takes the individual to be smart and aware and not fall for the traps. And so we do a class on that too. But we do have a, have a unit, we do investigate it. Um, it was just in the, in the paper, uh, I think, or on some media about the school board uh, lost the $719,000. We recovered $20,000 of that uh, before it left the country. The rest of it's gone. It's not gonna come back. And uh, we know how it was done uh, to a degree. Um, and I will just tell you in general, I'm not gonna talk about this specific case because it's still an active investigation. But usually the way this works, somebody owns a business, answers an ad that says, come work for us, be a money manager, and we will um, move money into your business account. And whatever we put in there, let's say it's $100,000, we'll let you keep 5%, so $5,000. Because what they're gonna do within 24 hours or less, they're gonna move that money to another account and eventually it's gonna go offshore and it's gonna to go to where the intended thief is, okay? Well, that mule, which is what it is, just not drugs, but that mule that's allowing somebody to use their business account is committing a federal crime. But they, they let greed, you know, easy money, okay? So they let greed take over. Yeah, you can use my account. I have personally investigated these cases probably 15 years ago. And I can tell you where all the money went, I got a quarter of a million back out of about 750,000 that was taken uh, before it left New York, and it was on its way to Latvia. In that particular case that I investigated, um, I know exactly what bank account it went into in Latvia. And, but that's when the, the, uh, the trail went cold because Latvia will not cooperate with law enforcement. And they have very, very super secret uh, banking law. So I know where it went when it left New York City. It landed in an account, but where it went from there, I don't know. And uh, that case was turned over to the FBI. In there. So they're very, very difficult. So the key, the real key to protect yourself on cyber crimes is take one of our courses, become aware of how to prevent, because they are very, very creative. They'll send you a thing that you think is coming from, say, Wells Fargo, for example. Look at, look at the email and see if it's really a Wells Fargo uh, email address. Because most people just look at, you know, it's got a Wells Fargo logo, for example. And I'm not saying Wells Fargo has been a victim of this. I'm just giving you an example because they, they are very, very good. And I get them in my personal email account often. And the easiest way to identify it is look at the email where it's coming from. That's the quickest way. Other question, I saw another hand somewhere. Yes, ma'am. So, so the question is, uh, is there regulations on mufflers? And the answer to that is yes. Uh, but uh, law enforcement is under the traffic laws and law enforcement has to hear it or see it. So you can call us if we can find the car, we might be able to do something. Yes, sir. So, and he needs to get down and read it. And I think, I know our parents, I think the kids, they need fathers, they need mothers. They need to respect law and order, the officers, the deputies. They need to come together and have a debate. And events where it's on the news newspaper. You have all-star jerseys, you have sheriff's teams, all-star jerseys. 
Well, you've made, you've made a lot of valid points, and uh, I'm going to hook you up with uh, Chief Williams and uh, because Pal falls under him, and you sound like a perfect volunteer that we could use. Uh, Chief Williams, just raise your hand so you guys can connect the end. And, and I, mean, I mean that seriously, uh, but what we do do uh, for the kids is we have school resource deputies in every school, and they make uh, you know, great interactions with the kids. In fact, today, I was at an elementary, middle, and high school handing out great kids awards uh, to, to a student that was in the area uh, in the county. Uh, our PAL is very active. We have an Explorers program. Uh, so we do a lot, but you're right. If there were more parents engaged, and I will tell you that you mentioned, you know, the phone, okay? I can't tell you how many uh, disturbance calls we go to over a phone and then when parents take the phone away uh, many kids then run away and so we have to investigate and search for them and it's over a phone so I think uh, the Florida legislature has passed some some bills uh, this session uh, that the governor uh, is signing I don't uh, it doesn't it's not in effect yet to try to uh, put the, uh, the tools back in the parents' hands to be able to uh, teach their kids from right and wrong. So I think, I think we're on the right path here, uh, but there's a lot of damage that's already been done. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Thanks. Uh, to follow up on the lady's question back there about the walking her dog, did the sheriff's department do anything to not only write to deal with people who are violent at all and not having a parking on the vehicle, but also the cars out here and typically enhance the sound with an alternate buffer to enhance the sound, but is there anything that they need to be done by your department? So we do have uh, decibel meters, which is what it requires. And there's also a statute that if you can hear the music outside a car so many feet, our deputies uh, can enforce that. Here's why we need the 37 additional deputies, because if you're going from call to call to call, you can't, you can't do the quality of life enforcement. So we do what we can in, in the in-between time, but, but the other calls would take priority over that. But we do generally have the, have the ability to do stuff. But when you hear something or see something, call us. Uh, we want to investigate it. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for taking my question. Um, with the enormous um, number of disabled people that have crossed the border in the last year, a couple of years here, um, has the city any action that you can take? So the question for those that may not have heard is about the illegal uh, migrants that are coming across the border have we seen it here i've been to the border twice it's paid for by uh, the drug dealers of flagler county i went there on a fact finding mission uh, with uh, a few other sheriffs uh, at the invitation of congresswoman kat kamick and uh, i will tell you the border is absolutely out of control 
it was worse the second time and it's been probably two years since I've been back. I can only imagine what's going on there now. What I will tell you is that because of what's going on at the border, every town, every city, every county in America is a border town. Uh, the fentanyl is flowing, it's coming across uh, uh, the Mexican border, methamphetamine, the same thing. That's affecting every community in this country. I can tell you uh, that uh, every month I get a report from the governor on uh, uh, inmates that are being released from uh, the state uh, correctional system that are here illegally in this country. And whether or not there is a detainer uh, by ICE on them, and if what county do they say they're going to with an address. We have not had any in Flagler. There have been in Volusia. They have been in Putnam. Uh, but nobody said that they're coming to Flagler. Uh, I will tell you that prior to uh, January 1st, 2021, when we would get these reports, ICE detainer, the answer would be yes. Now, 90% of them are no. I can tell you that my jail is an ICE detainer jail after the local charges are done. ICE would have 48 hours to come and get uh, the person that's here illegally. That doesn't happen anymore. I could tell you that that uh, deputies on the street have relocal. When they pull over a car, they could call Border Patrol. They thought that the individual was here illegally and work with them. And quite often, Border Patrol would come to the scene. They don't do that anymore. Uh, there's been one case recently where there was somebody uh, that we caught that did a very violent robbery in Houston, Texas, was in this country illegally. And since everything changed three years ago, that was the first case that they actually gave us an ICE detainer for our jail. Because we only had them on a misdemeanor charge while Houston was working to get their felony warrants. That's the only case. And it took a lot of work to get them to do that. But they did it. And so, you know, it's policy. And uh, so, you know, what I can tell you is that we haven't seen a lot in Flagler. But I can tell you, I personally pulled over a car over a year ago, and uh, uh, they didn't have a driver's license. They showed me an El Salvador passport. Been in this country for nine years. They were down here working, uh, doing drywall work. Car was registered in Tennessee. It was a real nice new SUV. And uh, but they can't get a driver's license because they're here illegally. And if they follow. Uh, our tax collector clearly follows the law because they tell me that people are always coming in trying to get a Florida driver's license, but they don't have the correct documents, so they, don't, they uh, refuse them. And so I'm not naive. I'm sure that we have uh, people here in this community that are here illegally. Um, but we're not seeing any significant crime that we can point to that's occurring because of somebody being illegally in this country here. I'm getting notices from all around the country. You know, my, my goal is to keep Flagler County this nice little bubble uh, that, uh, and not let it go to some things that you see and hear on the news around the country. Okay. Any other questions? So the question is, can we use our Mustangs up on 95 to increase uh, enforcement on 95? I can tell you that we run details on Interstate 95 uh, often, uh, but our focus really is on our, uh, our local roads. And uh, those, but that doesn't mean that they don't go up there because they do. And uh, what we really need is more troopers assigned to Flagler County to tame um, Interstate 95. But our traffic unit commander is here, I think. Yep. No. Yeah, oh, he had another meeting. So his division chief will make sure to relay that request. Okay. One short little question. 
question. The, the McKansas, the 95 off ramp at McKansas, the new off ramp there. Dangerous. Can you put a light there? Can you make a recommendation to somebody? Um, I can make that recommendation. Here's how the lights get done. They have to do a study, and because it's at an interstate interchange, that involves the state. And uh, so the recommendation can be done. I can tell you I made a recommendation once before at, at Old Dixie and uh, US-1, and my, my recommendation wasn't followed. But, you know, but I'll, be glad, I'll be glad to relay that to the mayor and, and uh, you know, see, see what they can do. It is, it's a poor design because of the way the road uh, is a hill and coming up. up. Was there another question? Yes, sir. You said that you have a ice container that you can have for 48 hours. Would that be sufficed by the city for about 48 hours? Then we have to release them by law. You have to release them. That's correct. Well, we, we don't have that problem. We Well, we didn't have that problem before January 2021 uh, because ice would always come within that 48 hours. Now the problem is they don't give us detainers. And if they don't give us detainers, we can't hold them even for the 48 hours. So while it's still, the agreement is still in existence, the, Fed, the federal government's not using it. Okay. So I wanna thank everybody for coming and for those online listening, for those that are here in the back, you'll find annual reports and some, some uh, giveaways if you wanna learn more about the Sheriff's Office. Uh, and uh, you can see the bricks that we're doing back there. And the giveaways, uh, including the annual report, were all paid by your local poison peddlers. So I want to thank them for giving us the money to be able to buy that stuff uh, for you. So thank you so much. Thank you.